the schedule. We're um, ready for our faculty panel. Our first speaker is Steve Zinn, professor and head of the Department of Animal Science at the University of Connecticut. He earned his um, bachelor's at Cornell, his master's and PhD degrees at Michigan State, and this is a bit of a homecoming for him because he completed a postdoc fellowship at the Wooster Foundation for Exper Experimental Biology in a lab just down the hill. So, welcome back to Worcester. He joined the faculty at the University of Connecticut after that, which was 23 years ago. Yeah, okay. He is current, okay, now here's the hard part. His research is focused on growth physiology and endocrinology in domestic species with an emphasis on somatotropic Access. Okay. He is currently the editor in chief editor in chief of the Journal of Animal Science, a position he has held since two thousand and eight. In addition, he is the editor in chief of Animal Frontiers, the review magazine of animal agriculture, which is a joint publication with three societies the American Society of Animal Science, the Canadian Society of Animal Science, and the European Federation of Animal Science. Uh, thank you very much, and it is kind of a homecoming, although there used to be a library here, um, and I spent a lot of time here, and so it's not the first time I've given a talk in this building, but the fourth time, so it's kind of nice. Uh, so, oh, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I see two slides. <laughs> um, so what I want to talk about today is really, I'm editor-in-chief of two journals that the Animal Science Society publishes. Uh, one is open access, one is not. Uh, and I want to talk about really why we do it that way, the different missions of the journals, and how we develop that, and then I'll be glad to answer questions. I think from the first two speakers, our membership is about the size of their staff, um, so it's a little bit different. We're one of those small groups. Uh, here are the covers, this is the 2011 cover of Animal Science and the second issue, uh, Animal Frontiers is brand new. The first issue was published in July of 2011. Uh, we do all the, we self-publish. Uh, as I was telling someone earlier, we have an editor-in-chief, a managing editor, and a technical editor, and a couple of people that help the technical editor when we get behind. And then we do all the HTML, we send it off to Highwire, and they take care of everything else. Uh, so I want to start with the Journal of Animal Science first. And really, the mission of the society and the journal is really to disseminate scientific information primarily to science, to sci other scientists in the field, and science educators that are then going to go out in the field. It's discipline-based in Nutrition, physiology, genetics, and then we have other topics. Uh, but it's also mostly geared towards, we call them managed species, but for the most part it's livestock. So cattle, pigs, sheep, horses. We have a large aquaculture group, um, so we have fish, and then we have some other species. We do some laboratory animal stuff. Look perplexed, because the last time I gave a talk here, or one of the first times I gave a talk in this building on endocrinology and cattle, I had some of the same blank looks. Why does anybody do this for a living? Um, so don't feel bad about it. Uh, when we talked about the, the magnitude of the industry, they got a little bit more interested, and then we still do basic science using these animal models. So, uh, But I want to give you a little view of our society. Um, so if you look at the bottom, in 2011 we had about 4,600 members. Pretty small. We have about 760 institutional members, so that's libraries. Uh, this is the first year in several that our numbers actually gone up, and primarily because 
We made nice deals on electronic versions and bundled multiple years and promising we wouldn't have an increase if you stayed on for multiple years. Um, librarians really seem to like deals. It works for us. Uh, I'm looking at my librarian over here, so it's... Uh, so that's really, again, very small society. We have 2,600 professional membership. These are primarily faculty at land-grant universities and PhDs at industry or ag-related industries. Uh, so really, how do we pay for this? And my tab didn't seem to work very well. Most of it is separation between those that are members and those that are not, and we have page charges. Uh, it's about $85. It is $85 a page for members. $170 for non-members. It makes no sense for anybody to publish without getting their membership first, which is how the pages charges are designed. Uh, we have not increased the page charges in five years. Uh, my executive director keeps hammering me on this and I keep ignoring her and at least for another six months or 12 months I'm going to be able to continue to ignore her. Uh, we also have open access opportunities at $2,500 for members and $3,250 for non-members. Um, and I like that decision. Instead of an author pays model, it's an author decides model. So I like that. I'll steal that, uh, those words. Uh, institutions pay $585. And again, multiple. That has not gone up considerably over the years and probably a little bit less than you pay for an Elsevier journal. Uh, we think they're the big monster too, so it's okay. Uh, and then if you want a paper copy, it's $100 extra. Uh, and the number of people that take paper copies is reduced dramatically. Uh, I would say primarily it's retirees and those of us that actually are involved in the paper part of the journal. Otherwise, most of our faculty, all of the students uh, get it electronically. Uh, it comes out once a month. We publish about 4,500 pages a year. Uh, no advertising. The repository cost came up. If you, someone wants to put into a university re repository, we request that they pay open access. 12-month moratorium seems to, I had someone tell me, well, that is open access. Um, we figured that's a pretty long moratorium, and we've argued about whether we're going to go to six months or not. That's the Journal of Animal Science that's been published for over 100 years um, and monthly for almost the last 80. But the second journal, and this just started, and it's really more of a magazine than a journal, uh, but this is Animal Frontiers, and as I said, the first issue came out in, uh, in July of this year. This is much more of a collaboration between really groups of animal science societies around the world. Uh, there's the American Society, the Canadian Society, and the European Society came together and felt that there wasn't this review opportunity for non-scientists. Each of us publish our own journal and they're geared for scientists. So the mission was a little bit different for this and the audience was a little bit different for this. Scientists read it and so far our distribution has been or our readers have been very good but it's primarily for policy makers, for educators involved in agriculture. In some cases producers of agriculture. But I think our main target was policy makers. And I, I can talk about more where the idea originated if, if you want to during lunch. Uh, but for us, it was important that it be international. And our authors come from all over the globe. And it was this new forum that for the, Europe, the three societies to get together and agree was, and agree quickly in three days in Rome, we agreed. And for those of you who've been to Rome, it was amazing because the meetings actually started on time. They brought us American coffee, so it had some liquid to it. And we got a lot of work done in three days. And I got the Europeans to agree to cover a third of the cost, so that was pretty nice. Um, and one of the important, we made two important decisions. One was that each uh, publication was going to be theme-based 
and that it would be open access. Because we weren't really looking for subscriptions per journal, and the group that we wanted this to go to, we felt that open access was important. And to give you some idea, um, the first issue was on carbon footprint, the second issue was on global beef production, and primarily because this was in conjunction with the Argentinian Animal Science Group, and beef production is their major commodity in Argentina. Uh, the next issue is genomics and selection, water use, animal welfare. It comes out quarterly. So pretty global issues, especially in the animal science or the animal related biology field. Uh, each issue is six to eight invited reviews. The audience is scientists, policy makers, and our industry. Authors are requested to speculate. And for those of you that have done a thesis, we ask them to speculate at about the same level that you would in the discussion section of a PhD dissertation. So it's okay to go off that deep end a little bit and overstate the data a little bit. Uh, there is a guest editor who's an expert in the field. Uh, and the authors receive 500 dollars per, or sorry, 500 euros, so I don't know what it is today, but it's a little bit more than 500 dollars, uh, per article. And we pay them because we've asked them to do these very quickly and turn, turn these around very quickly. The distribution goes to about 70,000 individuals and organizations, all electronically. Um, it goes to all the members of the societies, and that's only about 7,500 people. So there's about 63,000 other people we're distributing this to. Uh, the ag industry, government official, every university or ag or land grant university in the country, their dean and the department heads that are relevant get a copy. So why open access? And I think number one reason: wider distribution beyond the membership of the three societies. It was very clear, very easy to decide. So how do we pay for it? And I think that for a small society, this is very important. Because my board says, did you lose money? Did you make money? And if we come close to breaking even, then I get smiles and everybody talks about how great the journal is. Um, we lose a lot, you laugh, but <laughs> it's the first question. Treasure <laughs> uh, how do we pay for the publication costs? Each of the founding members, just about done, each of the founding members had to put up money. And we put up about twenty to $25,000 initially, and then that's gone up to about $35,000. Uh, new partners have to buy in, and we have the first one to buy in, and that'll, they'll come in at about $50,000. We do advertise, uh, which is new for us. We have foundational sponsors, sustaining partners, and about 100 subscriptions. And most of the subscriptions so far have come from deans who want the paper copy to distribute to their, I don't know who they're distributing it to primarily, but m many of these deans will have boards uh, that they want to give them to to show that they're doing something. That's how we fund it. And I guess there's time. I was told to stop, so here's our two journals again, and I guess I have a few minutes for questions. I think you need a microphone. <laughs> it's what they're... Thanks. Um, to what do you attribute the explosive growth in your student membership. I noticed there were 87 in 2007 and, I don't know, 3,000 now or something like that. Uh, we've really pushed the student membership, both undergraduates, because many of our undergraduates will go on to graduate school within our field and once they're a part of the society and can see that it has relevance, they stay a member of the society. And we've really pushed to get both undergraduates and new graduate students to our meetings. And once they see that value, uh, they can do that. Um, and the same with the graduate students. You know, I think our membership cost is $125 for professional memberships, and it's about 20 for graduate students. It's we're a very educational-oriented group. So for us, it's critical that the graduate students and the undergraduates be trained. 
and understand the value of that training as opposed to just a pair of hands. And I think that as we develop that, and then when you get to be my age, and you've ha been a part of this for 30 years, you understand the value that it's time to pay back. Um, you know, I'm editor-in-chief on top of what I do for a living. So when you say that you electronically distribute Animal Frontiers, you're talking, you're emailing it? Yes. Many, much of it is being emailed. Yeah. Uh, and we have that distribution list. And then uh, we also hold, you know, the platform is on Highwire and we'll give people access to that platform. So you but are giving access to Animal Frontiers on absolutely. Highwire. Yep. And, wow. Uh, <laughs> how did you choose your platform, Highwire? Uh, hi, we've been working with Highwire through the Journal of Animal Science, and there's five journals that, well now four, because one went to Elsevier, uh, that we've been working with Highwire for quite some time. That's what our managing editor has suggested. They've been really good to us. Um, and as I said to someone earlier, you know, we signed up for them for another five years, and they gave us a phenomenal deal. So, so they give you the, um, the specs on how to... Uh, s submit right our our journal. managing editors group and Highwire have worked out the HTML platform and they give me acronyms and you know my eyes glaze over and it just goes by and as long as it all looks good and I can get to it I'm pretty happy okay. thank you <laughs> another question Yeah, Highwire is actually kind of a cult. It's like their publishers love them and they have their own users groups, right? Yeah, as a matter of fact, we do. I get invited to a meeting in California every spring and a meeting in D.C. every fall, uh, which I've been to once because, again, it's the publishing world is over my head and as long as it looks good, it's okay to me. I've noticed that you have the uh, OA charge for 2500 Could you elaborate on what's involved in the OA charge? Is that, th is that the charge that you are paying to or who is paying to the whom? The author, is the author is paying us $2,500 to have the article open access, which is, and again, I'll steal someone else's <laughs> words from this morning, that's giving everybody access to the article without a subscription to the Journal of Animal Science or the American Society of Animal Science. Um, and that's about what we figure our costs are to put that manuscript on the platform. So, Steve, do you want to mention COPE at this point? Uh, I can talk about COPE now. I can talk about it a little bit later. Um, I was at the, at the University of Connecticut. I was just at the, upper the library's upper administration. And as a publisher of the Journal of Animal Science and the editor-in-chief of two journals, I find COPE ridiculously offensive. I think the idea of it is okay. But I think to say that it only can go to open access journals in my field we're the number one rated animal agriculture journal based on impact factor. We're not eligible. The journals in animal sciences that are eligible are journals that have impact factors that don't show up when the impact factors are sent out. And it, the library is deciding which journals are credible for scientists to use. And as a scientist and as an editor-in-chief, I find that offensive. I have talked to my librarians. We have a nice March meeting is going to be solely on open access and on COPE. I don't think that's appropriate. I don't think Provost saying we're going to value scientists in tenure based on the impact that you publish articles in. And by the way, and I don't mean to poke fun at anybody's background, but I will poke fun at a particular thing, the Pakistani Journal of Animal Science is open access. It does not have an impact factor. Yet that would be one that our provost is going to help you pay for because it's open access. And to me, I find that a poor choice and librarians and non-scientists deciding what's relevant for your publications. And then slamming you for it when you come up for tenure and promotion. So there's my diatribe on COPE. The idea is great. <laughs> great. Thank you. 
Thank you.